He's going to tell us all about the future of music. Thank you very much. Yes. Well, it's really not easy because I did not put any things to view the future, you know. But we 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 try we try to to figure out what could that be in the next decades, let's say. And uh, I guess that what's today is more fragmentation of the market. Uh, the streaming is on the pro rata model. The prescription is mainly playlist. There is a hyper concentration of live music uh, operators too. And we are 7 billion on earth, more or less, which leads to 45 million of tracks available, more or less, to the customers. I'll be quick because my, I want a story to, to, to be honest, but I think that I don't have time. So I could share with anybody by email this story because I love writing things, Great. to be honest. Okay, but to be really s straight, and I'm curious about your mm -hmm. feelings on that. I guess that in, let's say, in 2038, the fragmentation will be more than ever and uh, nobody will really sign a, a sheet of paper for contracts. It will be, uh, thanks to the blockchain, uh, easier and safer. Um, the model of, uh, the pro rata model of uh, the platforms of streaming will become the user centric that leads to maybe better revenues for a small artist but who knows? And the model of searching for a track on a platform maybe disappear, and you will only have like playlists, uh, and you can choose some playlists, but not not the, the the only tracks. We will be 13 billions. That leads to 90 million of tracks. That's the reason why the model of place will be easier because it will be like a prescription. Uh, China, Africa uh, will be definitely in the game, challenging the, the big markets, or maybe China will be the first market with its own platform, maybe with an alliance with Russia, and uh, they become uh, the big challengers to Spotify that will become a Chinese company, who knows. Uh, well, that's our, that was tracks, and uh, I'm trying to figure out. It's not easy, and I'm curious to to hear what are the feelings to have uh, listening to me. Yeah, so you, so you, so you think it's going to be, uh, the future of music is going to be influenced by the way people access it, uh, rather than necessarily the way people create it? Yeah. Okay. That's, That's a paradigm. <coughs> okay. Well, w if we're talking about recorded music, I suppose, uh, the, the question I have about the future of music is if it's going to be quite so dominated by English language pop, I would have thought mm. that's probably going to uh, fall away a bit. As, when, I, when I look at artists these days, I kind of notice they have more access to... Um, you know, when I was a kid and I, I listening to music, I, I really depended on how much pocket money I could get and how many records I could buy and hear or, or tape off my friends. Now people have access to a lot more music and you see a lot more influences of music that isn't necessarily British pop rock music coming in coming into the music they make. You know, there's more kind of music coming from other countries, there's more music coming from other times, there's more jazz, there's more classical, there's more kind of uh, African sounds in the music, there's more Asian sounds in the music. Uh, that would be uh, where I would start to look at the future of music, what it's going to sound like. Um, how we access it is something we might talk about later. I'm Mark, by the way, sorry. <laughs> I have a record label in Madrid and I'm um, chair of the Impala, which is a kind of uh, association for record labels. So I'm always going to think that record labels are going to have a part to play in the future of music. Uh, and uh, I'm always going to uh, focus it from the point of view of what the artists are going to be doing because that's what a record label does. It kind of interve intervenes between artists and, and, uh, and, and fans. Kai, what do you think? Um, I like that approach 
I think I think just positioning it as streaming and playlists and thinking of music in those terms doesn't really sort of make me feel very excited about music. I, I like the idea that you're focusing more on on the kind of how the way genres are turning and with places like Portugal having an event like Westway where you can uh, interrupt with people from different cultural backgrounds and push the sound, especially given that there was uh, a kind of strict government for years and years, so, so you see it evolving. We're also seeing great sounds which come back from Tallinn, um, and we're seeing like all the, these mixtures coming about that we've never seen bef before in a, in a way. Um, you know, and, and I think that with guitar bands and your oasis is and, and your sort of pastiche I'm sort of seeing that there's more excitement towards bands like um, I don't know Short Paris for example, Glint Shake, all these other bands coming out of Russia um, people that are, are making music that suddenly is all of a sudden getting people going oh, it's kind of a bit like that but I can't quite pigeonhole it and um, it'd be interesting to see more funding for events like this that are able to help create this thing so people can be excited about music again. Too many people are like fed up with, um, you know, your kind of sort of middle of the road sort of indie landfill stuff that come again and again. Um, and yeah, I'd like to see more of that. And then I, I also think that in terms of major labels influence, I think with enough um, funding based on recognition. So. For instance, I come from. I work for Gigwise, for a music blog, and the, in Canada, for example, there's a, there's a one band came through called Samurai Champs playing Tarn the other day, and the way the way they work is they they get positioned in a space that major labels would love their new artists to get positioned based off government funding, and, and they'll get repeat funding if they do well and get recognition for blogs. So I feel like we as as journalists have an influence to be able to change the the, the level and individuality and the quality of of music come breaking out mm -hmm. and, and we a lot of the indie journalists anyway like you know like drown sound line of best fits so all, all the kind of a lot they, they get tracked by like major labels that will look to see what what's being promoted and some of them will get picked up and i think with enough enough discussion and sharing information between there i think in 10 15 years you, you're going to see more and more great music that you never quite heard in that way and it'll be really astounding and i think independent labels have a role to play to make sure that it's delivered in, in a quality that the, the masses deserve and I think more and more people are starting to realise that Spotify is is a bit tinny when you when you crank it up on a big PA system in a pub um, and, and if you want to pl play and, and the speakers are evolving there, there was an exhibition in, in Tallinn uh, with 17,000 pound speakers so the highest ones being 250 grand I'm not saying everyone will afford them but I think that there's always going to be a market for independent labels to push unique music yeah I, th I think uh, I think um, after, after a long time in kind of stasis I think the uh, quality of sound is improving a bit I was also I, was, I wanted to ask Paul who's been up all night recording in uh, in a shopping center in a Porto yeah uh, if that could be a model for the future I mean it's, a, it's obviously a space where uh, artists you know, you, this is what you were talking to me about just before we came in. Mm. All, all, all musicians congregate in this place. They have they have a space which they can use to record, to to make music. And Paul, because he was coming over here, went in and did a harmonica session That's for someone right, yeah. there. So it's really interesting. So I looked at the I looked at the you know the panel briefing. And it's like the future of music, which is a big topic. And we've dived, we've I think I feel like we've dived. We've right just in. done it, we just finished it. We've dived right into this very kind of um, industry focused kind of, um, through, you know, we looked at it through a, a kind of really industry lens. And I think it might be worth zooming out a little bit and kind of going, for me, first of all, you know, the future of music is driven by people making music, people enjoying it, mm. right? Um, and making music has always. Uh, been catalyzed by technology, whether that was the invention of the piano, the saxophone, synthesizers, etc., etc., etc. And what we're seeing, not just in music, but across uh, across the creative industries, is I think this um, blurring of the lines between creative professional, the prosumer market that they call, access to uh, the ability to record music. So there's this incredible democratization, and the base of the pyramid almost has become infinite. So anybody 
can record music anywhere on anything. But why wouldn't you have recorded the harmonica part for this uh, recording from your house in, in London? Why was it important to come to a Porto to do it? Because fundamentally, music is a collaborative art form. And so like, it's, it's not like standing in front of an easel with paints, where you stand on your own and you paint a painting. Music, even though, and this was a piece of electronic dance music, mm -hmm. and yet the producers, the artists wanted me to come and collaborate with them physically, like be in a space with them, uh, and collaborate creatively, because ultimately um, that feeds the authenticity, actually, of the music that we're making together, okay? And I, I feel really the, the future of music isn't going to be decided by Spotify, and it's not going to be decided by YouTube, and it's not really um, even necessarily going to be decided by artists, it's going to be decided by fans. Mm. Because fans have got access to all music of all time, all the time, on any device, mm. anywhere they are, right? So right. really, yeah. it's, it's, it's only people's curiosity and artists' ability to generate fantastic, rich, diverse, um, significant, authentic content mm. that's going to drive the market. I, th I think it'd be interesting, uh, Fisher Spoon had just did his new album, Sir, written partly by Michael Stipe, and, it, and he put the lens into his room, so he was filming from his intimate space um, with his lover on his left-hand side. Um, and he told me that the idea was to subvert the, this uh, traditional idea of, of stage and performer. And he, the fact he's obviously everyone's into Instagram and it, pe people's natural interest, if the fans are going to dictate the market, I feel like the artist has a responsibility to play to look beyond the traditional format of like stage, sound man, sound check. And maybe we could like think as labels if you're promoting artists to do stuff in more unusual spaces, more private spaces in the video that you make, whether it be the performance. I think that happens a lot, right? Yeah. Mm. But I think, I think the, the, the fight, surely, the battleground, if there is one, is this idea of curation. That if the base of the pyramid is, infl is infinite and everybody can access all of music history and anybody can make music today, so there's just like this incredible surplus of music, then the, the critical thing becomes the lens. And that's where I think, you know, Mark, your point about independent labels becomes so crucial, and Kai, you were saying this as well, speaking to the same point, that actually the future of music is in normal people trying to figure out what to listen to and why, isn't it's, it? It's all about context, isn't it? I mean, the, the, you, you say that you can access all the music, and, and it's true, you can on your phone, pretty much. Mm. But getting the context on it is... Uh, you know, it's just it's just lacking, and a playlist doesn't give you context. Mm. You have to find out about the mu even whether you're listening to old music or to all, or to new music. Uh, I think the point about the the getting in the same space to make the music and getting in the same space to experience the music is what is what gives it was what gives you the context. Mm -hmm. Off a phone, it's not it's not really there in the first instance. Is that right? I don't know, but then you know. Every generation has had like its big summer hit when you were a teenager, and that hit, that song that was the soundtrack to your summer holiday or whatever it might be. I don't think there was a great, you know, the context didn't come from the artist, the context came from your activities, right? And I think that's going to continue. So for me, I think the context was the music that surrounds it. I mean, you. Your access to that music was uh, was on the radio or at the fair or at the fairgrounds, you know, like the classic place where you hear music. Yeah, but music. It's, a, it's a two track thing. So you have some people who are going to be really interested in the artists and some people who really aren't. You've got some people who are going to be listening to music and actively uh, you know, listening to it actively and investigating where it came from, what it is, and you've got then a whole bunch of people who are listening very passively. And I think the future of music is going to continue to fragment. In front. I think your point was very good that, that, that you know, this fragmentation that's occurring is, is likely to, to just increase and increase and increase, which I think is a phenomenal opportunity in terms of um, diversity of content, because it means that where historically, you know, somebody, if you were in a niche genre, uh, and you know, there were only so many shelves in the record store, and now you can, you know, the record store is infinite, and if you generate a connection and are relevant with a fan base that may be quite small, but on a global scale, then I think there's a phenomenal opportunity for artists in a way that there never has been before. 
The thing is, if, if your fan base is small, you need to get them to uh, invest their money yeah, you in do. you yeah, of course. In other, wa other ways than by listening to it on, a, on their telephone, because that that's not going to... Yeah, but if you... It's not going to enable you, you to make music. If you aggregate a niche fan base across territories around the world in a way that you weren't able to previously, then, you know, niche genres, whether it's jazz, funk, folk, all these kind of things where people like 10 years ago were saying, oh, well, jazz is dead, right? Streaming is going to kill jazz. Jazz is like the hottest thing right now in the UK. It's phenomenal. It's an incredible, you know, um, scene. Right now, it's fizzing. It's brilliant. They're doing great, right? And they're making fantastic music. And this, you know, 10 years ago, everyone was going, jazz is dead because of streaming. And now you're like, okay, no, but actually, um, you know, the per stream rate is crap. But if they're entrepreneurial about how they're, they're building a business model around their creative vision, a lot is going on. And that's phenomenal. I like to see that. What, what, what do you think, like, there's only a, f a very small amount of bands now that make a huge, huge amount of money to the point where they'd spend like one million pound on a video. Do you think that the children now growing up and consuming music will have the same kind of, be as dazzled? Because you could have these like metal bands like, like Tool, for example, they spent a million pound working with a fight club director. When we're growing up, we're consuming music on MTV2 and it's this massive spectacle. And do you think that the reduced budgets could impact on the, on the way that people value music as an art form, especially with things people like YouTubers be actually being like more cool and subversive for teenagers? So you might get a, an entire generation that's a bit like, yeah, I like music, but they might not obsess about it in the same way. So do you think that there is a danger in, in holding back funds to do ridiculously lavish things for, for new artists that are on quite popular, you know? Oh, what you think? You're, you're, you're actually investing, well, you're a principal in this market, you're actually yeah. taking I also, I also have kids who are like 18 and 16. Okay. So, th so I think the, the people who are prone to getting obsessed with music, get obsessed with music, and it kind of it kind of takes over a significant part of their life. The same as it does with football. I know there's a lot more kind of glamour and projection of football at the moment. It's, like, well, it's more on the TV. But... Uh, your introduction to music, you know, I grew up in the in the sixties and seventies in the UK, so the Beatles were on the radio the whole time, and you had Abra, etc., etc., and then uh, and then punk rock, and then there was a there's, there's a kind of accumulation of things, you know, music was that important in my life, and it was that important in my life, and then it got to be that important in my life, and it kind of took over, and I stopped going, you know, you you had the choice of whether you went you, you went to see your team at home, or you went to a gig. And the gig started taking over, but I think that still happens with kids. I think there's still, I think people who are going to get obsessed with music do get obsessed with music. Their access point may, may be distinct, but I, I don't think they're less mm. committed to the form than we were. I think that's the point, and I think that, that segment of the market of active listeners, if you like, are going to experience the most phenomenal surge of uh, information. So right now, you know, use a streaming platform, very few streaming platforms have great data. So you're looking, you're listening to a band you love and you go, oh my God, who was the drummer? Who was the producer? What else have they done? What else can I connect it? You know, and the, the journey, I think, if you're into music, the journey you go on is like you find something you love and you go, oh, what else have they done? And who else did they work with? And you kind of network out from something you discover at some point in time. And I think the, the opportunity ahead of us is these incredibly... Um, data rich experiences that people can dive into whether it's through VR or AR you know um, to to really explore music in a way that we have not been able to in the past and I think that that, that means you're going to have you know a segment of the market who are active listeners who just delve in and love it and there has always been that segment yeah. of the market the big question is what happens to the 80% of the population who are passive listeners who just listen to the radio, maybe they buy one CD at Christmas, and in the 21st century, how does that contribute to the music ecosystem? Yeah. I totally agree with the, the, the search for experiencing things by the music, but mm. music is one of the media of the experience. And uh, as a festival organizer, I saw the evolution in 10 years and that. People just want something that is very, a singularity in the experience. And I guess that music, streaming or live music or anything, recorded music, let's say, 
I guess the experience is, is maybe the key, and if we can talk about the future, it will maybe uh, formalize, I don't know the, 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 the correct word, but for, formula, the formalization of music must uh, uh, and will be around this experience and all the, the offer that you can have from the music, from a song. Mm. So, so, I mean, what, you know, the, the, what, what we're talking about being the past, the past of music or the music of the music we've grown up for in the sense of, you know, again, in the sense of monetizing it. We're talking about an era of mass consumption, which probably is beginning to come to an end, you know, not in music, but in everything. You know, people, people want things that are kind of uh, more specific to themselves, you know. And I imagine, you know, with, maybe, with, maybe with clothes, with 3, 3D printing, they're going to start making little, little changes to the clothes themselves. So it's going to be something that's in, individualized to them. I think mu the challenge for music is possibly going to be how to, uh, how to, you know, how to fit into that, that new, um, that new way of consuming things. Mm. You know, it's not going to be a question of selling hundreds of millions of exactly the same things so that everyone's got the same record. You know, it's going to be, it's going to be a bit different. Well, I guess. I'm, I guess. I'm, I'm not the prophet who can tell you how that's going to be, but it's, but it's there. We can see it already. I think that's a point. People are launching uh, adaptive music services. So, you know, the classic uh, use case seems to be like the gym. So well, you're going for a run, and the, the harder you run, the higher your heart rate goes. The music follows you. It becomes more intense. The, the, you know, the beats per minute goes up, the speed of the music, all this stuff. And so actually what happens is you have a service that has, you know, a series of stems. An algorithm is deploying more or different stems depending on your heart rate, the feedback that you're giving to a device. So there's a, for me, this, this brings a real challenge. So on the one hand, in, in the old world, okay, there was a really uh, hard barrier between creative content, the world of creative content, the world of like production music, utilitarian music. Okay? And I really feel that in streaming, these platforms where you have a lot of mood playlists and lifestyle playlists, are starting to break that barrier down and it's becoming a very permeable membrane which, which has threats and opportunities on both sides. So, you know, um, actually if you look at, you know, like, you know, uh, Facebook advertising and the election of Donald Trump and this idea that you have, you know, Facebook ads that are iterating thousands of times a second depending on how people are interacting with them. And each advert may have a video and the video is iterating through an algorithm. It's, it's, there's a machine learning engine behind it and an artificial intelligence is, is iterating that advert thousands of times a second to get the optimized imagery. And at the same time, you have services that are iterating music alongside that video content. Now, that's not something that a human being, a human composer, can possibly keep up with, right? But equally, I don't know that I think that music is pretty utilitarian. And, and for me, it sits alongside lots of pretty high quality production libraries. And you say, okay, so then you bleed into like, you know, uh, yoga music and you know it's like chill out music well how much of that actually is incredibly creative and how much of it is ambient and can be replicated by machine you start to get into this very dangerous world of saying where you know what is actual culturally significant creative content and where does that line sit and how does that bleed across into utilitarian music do you, know, do you know Tony Scott? Do you know a clarinetist called Tony Scott from the, from the fifth book? He was a hard bop clarinetist and he made the first yoga album. Mm. He kind of, uh, <coughs> it's, it's an album he made in the 60s. He, he just kind of ba banished from the jazz scene altogether. Mm. Moved, moved to, moved to uh, I'm not sure if, if it was Tibet, but somewhere, somewhere, somewhere around there. Mm. And he just made a series of clarinet albums which were, which were for yoga. And that was, that was what happened to the rest of his career. I think what you're, t what you're talking about, we did, we did say that people like to be in the same place to make music, and there's an urge for people uh, to be in the same place to experience it as well. You see the massive sure. growth of festivals. Mm -hmm. yeah, now, sure. Sure. when I go to a festival, I'm aware that a lot of the people around me aren't quite as uh, necessarily engaged with each artist as, you know, there's artists I go and see, there's, there's artists I don't bother to go and see, but there's a large part of that crowd that's just passing through and picking things out as, as they go, and are not kind of, you know, maybe they, they're not as old as me, and they're not as used to kind of going just to see bands. Um, 
So maybe that's where the, that's where the new kind of uh, mass consumption is. It's it's in the, it's in it's in the light. Yeah, but I think I mean that comes uh, you know the, back to the first thing I said about the idea that the future of music is going to be driven by really the interaction between artists and fans, whether that's through recorded music or live, whatever it might be, and that sense that music is fundamentally a collaborative art form, and the collaboration goes between the artists themselves and the performers on the track, but it, it extends to the audience. Okay. Yeah, sure. That collaboration, it's a, it's a two-way street when you perform, right? So, so my there, there are artists for whom it's more so and, and less so. I mean, but there's certainly bands yeah, I accept that, that but depend entirely on what's going on in the audience. But my, my point is, you know, there is a huge audience for music. Music has, it retains an incredibly important place in not everybody, but some people's lives, a lot of people's lives. And therefore, I mean, I remain fundamentally optimistic about the future of music because I think, you know, whatever happens with this bleed across, these lifestyle playlists, utilitarian music, and people being less engaged directly, I think, you know, we're, we're kind of kidding ourselves if we think that the 80% of the global population who are passive radio listeners are suddenly going to become 999 Spotify users, right? They're not, but the 20% that are go from an average spend of $60 a year to $120 a year. That's really interesting. I think the most, I think the most engaged go beyond spending 10 euros a month on Spotify. I agree. Honest. No, I, absolutely. And what I'm saying is, as a, but as a, as a baseline, as a threshold revenue, it's pretty good. I'm optimistic too. Yeah, you, you would must be optimistic. You must be. I think, Guys, I'm sorry. I'm I, think, I think that the... Uh, that there's a lot of people, I mean, I mean you think of organisations like PRS and, and PPL paying into artists' careers. Yeah. Um, and you're talking about s streaming and Spotify income, but could there not be more done for collection societies across developing countries and like India and China where you've got this huge, huge population and a sort of burgeoning middle class, I suppose, that, where there might be infrastructure starting to be developed. I know that the UK's got a trade mission out to Mumbai, they're starting to do sort of showcase things like this to the point where if you're early and involved in it, you could perhaps make it, the infrastructure there to then, because as far as I'm aware, all the, all the P PRS and stuff that people get, like over maybe 40%, I don't know the exact figure, is coming from um, UK and US, and, and all the plays over there in public spaces aren't being sort of... Listen, Take you know, um, the Berkeley School of Music put out a report, even, uh, was it like 20, 2012, 2013, uh, that showed, that, you know, made the calculation that 25 to 30 percent of gross revenues to the music industry are misapplied. Okay, so we, we live in an incredibly inefficient industry. Yeah. We accept that. We understand that. I think we're further down the track than your description might suggest. So in India, you know, there is IPRS and IPPL, so they, they're, they're, they are putting in place the kind of infrastructure that's needed to collect. Mm. Now, whether they're collecting efficiently, I mean, I have a thing where across the globe, you know, I think they're called collecting societies for a reason rather than distribution societies, right? Um, and, and we've seen problems in a lot of territories around the world. But You've touched on the most problematic and possibly the most boring part of Paul's, <laughs> ah, Paul, ah, Paul's ah, job ah. of mine, but, ah. but, but we're, we're ready to talk about it. I just play harmonica. Uh, yeah. So... I, but I think, listen, I remain, I remain optimistic because the digital opportunity is granular data, okay? So looking forward, there is no excuse not to know every interaction with every track at the track level in real time everywhere in the world. Well, except, except for there's the factor of how many people are there listening to it. Yeah, but that's, that's you know, there are two things. So you have, you have uh, private listening, so through you know um, streaming platforms, let's say, and then you have public performance through venues who are licensed by capacity. Yeah, I think that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. No, not do I. So no. long as so long as but so long as the systems get put in place and fundamentally, the, one of the big problems of of the recorded music industry on both the publishing and the master rights side is, is that <clears throat> the most important ingredient in the mix is the metadata. And it's always the intern who has the job of inputting the metadata. So it's like the most menial administrative task that's done by the most junior person in the office who isn't given the right amount of time, doesn't have the expertise, doesn't necessarily understand what they're doing. So we're building castles on sand. Now, how are we going to solve that, Mark? My only, con my only concern with this is the, is, the, is, the, is, the, is the kind of dystopian angle of 
of knowing what everyone's listening to mm-hmm. at every moment in their lives. I mean, I think I think privacy is going to be a going to be a big issue. And I, is this I a, do we do we still believe there's a notion of privacy? I do. Yeah. Do you? Do I believe that there is a notion of privacy? Yeah, online. Should we put Come that out on. to the public? So who, hands up who thinks there's still a viable notion of privacy online. <laughs> right, no one. Right, tall. fucking, that, like, that's, not that's one hand. Question. Nobody? No. Do, right. do, do you think there should be? Hands up who thinks there should be. Yeah, of course. Hands up who thinks it's possible. <laughs> All right, so hang on. So we have a, a, we have a really interesting thing here where... Nobody thinks there's privacy online. Quite a few of you think there should be. It's about 80%. I would have said. Some of you, but only very few of you, think it's viable. So that's quite, a, that's quite a pessimistic view of the future, right? But on the other hand, who cares? Does anybody care? What does it matter to you? Do I care, yeah. Why? I couldn't tell you. Is that, yeah, this is not, the funny not thing. your business, mate. I, I have this notion. I know, but I know, but I agree with you. I'm not saying it's a disagree. I actually agree with you. I agree. I have this notion that actually I'd like to, you know, my, you know, I would like my uh, activity to be private. If I'm active in a private space, I want it to be private. I think you're incorrect. I think I think inevitably there will be. I mean, uh, there's veils around what you do with your bank at the moment. Yeah. Uh, I just think that there's going to be ha- have to be an extension of that. You know, it's going to have to be legislated for. I think the last uh, 40 years of small government and not intervening in what businesses do is probably coming to an end. And I think I think you're going to see a reaction to that. And we've got to be the ones who drive the governments to legislate in favour of what we think is important. But does, uh, that, does that potentially harm the music industry? Because at the moment, actually, we've got this glut of data where we can see what fans are doing, we can see how they're interacting with with music, and we can respond to that. And, 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 you know, make, release, promote music and target it according to that data. So actually, we're benefiting from a lack of privacy. Yeah, I think there's a question of whether there may be things even more important in the world than record companies making money, though. What? <laughs> <laughs> Not really. Says the chair of Impala. No, and I, I, look, again, I agree with you. I think this is a nice panel because we all agree, right? But Kai, do you agree? <laughs> Just checking. Um, I, I, th- I think that there should be... Um, privacy and that label, that labels should definitely make whatever sort of efforts they can to kind of not take data to be like a driving force and be a bit more sort of qualitative in their interactions and, and predict trends. I feel if you if you if you're looking at data, you're always reacting to stuff. Yeah, pe- people get lost in there. It's not it's not necessarily a creative force. The the, the amount of is it the opposite data you can force? yeah. I mean, I think I think the amount of data you can have yeah and trying to make decisions on it is. I see it all the time, you know, I see a lot of people whose, whose jobs seem to be predicated on that, but I've never seen any of them come up with anything that I was particularly interested in yet, you know, as a, as a fan. Yeah, I mean, look, I, 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 have this, uh, I have this classic moment um, some years ago, and it'll, I'll date it pretty quickly, but so I was in a, I was in a bar uh, in, a, in a club with a very senior A&R guy from a very large company in the music space, um, and there was a band playing and everyone was going nuts and it was kind of like an old school soul band and it had this real kind of cool following and everybody was into it and I said to the guy, so what can you do with this? And the place was rammed and everybody was dancing and, having, and he said, absolutely nothing, horns are dead, <laughs> right? Six months later, Back to Black came out. <laughs> yeah, Horns are dead, right? So the, the point is, you know, this idea that, that, that the future is predicated on the past, I think we have to break out of if we're going to continue to be creative and if we're actually going to give consumers a rich musical tapestry that they want and they deserve. And I think there is a fundamental problem when it comes to the media, when it comes to you know, radio stations and the other gatekeepers where actually all they do is perpetuate the past. So, when, you know, in AIM in the UK, we have... Uh, the independent sector in the UK is like 22, 23% of the market. And whenever I challenge some of the um, you know, radio stations and stuff and say, why aren't you playing more independent music? And they say, oh, we're playing your market share. And I say, well, market share only reflects what happened yesterday. And we're releasing the independent sector is responsible for 80% of the releases in the world. So it's like, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, every roll of the dice should be a new roll of the dice, right? Every time you, 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 you try to do something, shouldn't it be a meritocracy? 
And my question for the future of music is how do we, how do we create, because it never has been, how do we create a market that isn't payola, streamola, and the future, how do we create a market that's a meritocracy that allows creative artists and their commercial partners to do phenomenal job and actually uh, be rewarded fairly for the fruits of their labor? But surely artists are as susceptible to these metrics as anyone else is. I mean, hmm. the amount of uh, emails you get in a week from bands saying, look how many, fa look how many Facebook likes I have, and this kind of stuff. And, yeah. You know, uh, um, so, and, I mean, and I accept it's a deep problem. It's a really deep problem, and we all suffer <coughs> from it. You know, we all have those kind of confirmation biases. Do you think, do you think that what you're saying is like ra radio pluggers, not all, a kind of producers are favouring majors like kind of out oh, of they tradition. They undoubtedly are. They undoubtedly what, are. Come on, man. So what's the, what's the logic? Is, is it just like old school mentality? No, but there, 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 there is one very obvious reason. I mean, three, having three yeah. conversations a week is yeah. infinitely preferable to them to having 125 yeah. conversations yeah. a week. And that's the same with uh, s streaming services as it is with, is with radios. Yeah. There's also a very simple, another simple thing. Like uh, you have one global massive priority artist, and when they come to town, they want the interview. And if they want the interview, they better play nice with you, which means playing your stuff. In fact, I would suggest at the moment it's probably worse than it was when you were fighting for shop space <coughs> in physical shops and for window space. I think it's more of a problem with some streaming services. Uh, who won't be named, uh, centre more on, you know, they'll tell you their data companies, not music companies, mm. uh, because that deep down is where they think they make their money. I think that I think we're in a real transition period though right now. Yeah. I think I think you know I I remain optimistic that music will out. It's it's regrettable that the system seems to be retrograde, and seems not to challenge itself enough. I, mean, I think what we're saying is. We'd love to see a world in which actually the field is more open. But this is this well, what I do as a label is to absolutely ignore them. You know, I mean, I, I would just wouldn't be interested in music that came exactly. from that the place. Exactly. The reason for, for founding a label for myself was, well, if everyone agrees on that, that's the this. Yeah. So, but that's it, like everything changes. Nothing changes. Nothing new about that. You've got to kick the door down and be creative. So, I mean, so, I mean, in order to read graphs and make predictions about what's happened, even if it was only five minutes ago, because you can get real-time data. In order to do that, we already have the major, we already have the major labels. And the, his advice was to new bands to just be like, kind of, he talked about analog communication in his muso way. And I think that hosting people, like, like almost like pen pal, you know, like you have someone stay in Portugal, and then when you go to Sweden, you've got a place, and you, you exchange networks like that yeah. in, in person, and then that will give you a long term. I'd, what you might find is that even unsigned artists now are going to do more travelling and cover more miles and play more shows and build fan bases that, exactly. than ever before because I think that there is a, a sort of discontent. Maybe people at your age, early 20s, there's going to be a massive group of those people who just don't want to deal with screens all the time. And I think that's as, as well with the fact that vinyl sales are, are peaking. Um, you know, pe people are looking back. The days are gone where you get on New Music Friday and you get a record deal off the back of it, I think. There's a, about two years ago, I think, that Spotify playlist could literally just... Every a and in the country w w would pay attention, because maybe there was less of the less numerous, but now I think it's, Spotify's become a public... I don't know, it's, it was a private owned, now it's become shares, and so, so now, now there's, there's a huge amount. So, so you're, you're going to be in a, a swamp of loads of different stuff, so it would be really hard to be more prominent, like, say, like, shop window space. It is, and I, I think it's just great to hear people saying that, you know, um, a generation of people in their 20s differentiate between an online world and an offline world. I mean, you know, isn't that the big fear that we get sucked into just an online world? And I think the fact that we're sort human beings, we're, you know, we're cognizant beings and we're self-aware. I think and that's like, just old people thinking young people are stupid. You know? Exactly. No, exactly. Um, they, they've but always old been people wrong always think it. young people yeah, are sure, stupid, you know? sure. Isn't it? From the 60s, the 70s, every generation. Sure, sure. So right. it's nothing new. Like, everything changes, nothing changes. And my, so I remain optimistic because if you're an artist now, the choice, it's more complicated to get going because you have more choice. In the old days, it was like one route or maybe two. I thought, yeah, on the, other, on the other hand, and a word of caution here, in the, in the streaming world, uh, a stream 
from 60 years ago is valued the same as a stream from now. Mm. So, so it, <coughs> whereas, you know, even 20 years ago, we would sell a back catalogue record a lot cheaper than, than a new release, mm. and new releases were dominating sales. That's not happening with streaming anymore. Sure. Back catalogue is dominating the consumption of music. It's about 80-20 in favour of back catalogue. And because each stream is worth the same, and because the major labels are paying fast <coughs> lower royalties to... Uh, mm. You know, to whoever, to Sonny Rollins, and they ask, <laughs> and they ask the new artists. Yeah, but hang on, sorry, one thing. They are, they are making all, all the monies going. Okay, but listen, one, one major streaming platform mm -hmm. uh, talks about the fact that, yeah, 80% of the, 80, sorry, 90% of catalogue listened to on their service is post-2000. Oh, really? Yeah. It's one of the big ones. I'm not okay. sure if that's good or bad. Well, do you know what? For the independent community, I think it's fantastic. And creatively? Creatively, I think it's awesome because it just shows that actually people are into new music. Yeah. And I, th I, think, I think that in the f basically they, they showed that the way I get promoted stuff by um, PRs is, is, is there was this emphasis on release date, but it's like data and Spotify has, has proven that um, a lot of the most of the plays come within a, over, like the next year. Mm -hmm. so, you, so you'll get your, your plays on, on the first year. Um, but then, is people because you can get it whenever for free. People aren't like rushing to the door anymore. So I think it'd be interesting from a management point of view to sort of think about um, the way that campaigns are run yeah. according to p listening habits. They're like saying it was driven by the fan. Yeah. Fa fans don't mind waiting a year to hear it. So so you've got to kind of alter. Yeah, we see that. I mean, that's that's happening. We see that a lot. We see we see campaigns predicated on the build rather than the release. And, and, you know, that's the ultimate um, validation. I mean, there was some interesting data out recently from WIN, the Worldwide Independent Network, uh, that looked at the fact that, um, by and large, say, major label priority releases hit the, the, the hot playlists on release day, mm. on Spotify in this case, the analysis was done. Um, whereas independent releases take on average 10 days to earn their place yeah. on those playlists. Um, what they did see though is on the flip side, the major label tracks fall out on average 10 days earlier than the mm. independent playlist, the independent tracks. So what you're seeing is actually the major labels have done these deals really where the track bounces straight onto the big playlist as soon as it's released, but actually audiences are selective. And so independent tracks that don't have that, that marketing spend behind them that guarantees them that place necessarily earn their space on that playlist. We know that independent music, okay, we can generalize and say independent music is probably more mm, culturally rich perhaps, more nuanced, more niche, less mainstream plastic pop. Uh, and what we see from the streaming platforms is actually that uh, independent music over-indexes for people who are prepared to pay for a subscription. So, you know, 9.99 subscribers listen to more independent music than the whole of the market listens to independent music. And what we see also I think it's also, isn't it, is how one other, one other data point that I think is really important is that independent music shows far lower skip rates than the whole of the market. So what we see is that independent music, so like actually rich, culturally interesting, edgy, somewhat niche music, appeals to the highest paying consumers and is the stickiest content. Now that, again, that for me is a massive sign for optimism for like interesting music. Mm. No? That kind of begs the question if they should look at how they distribute the money. Ha! Better. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and the, I, debate, I the debate is live about user-centric models. Yeah, I mean, I, th I, th I think that, that is something we probably don't have time to explore. But... I think more, more, <laughs> more could be done to support physical releases, especially from an editorial point of view. Like we, yeah. we always put embeds of, of Spotify and SoundCloud and the rest of it, and we're driving you know, the point one of a penny per mm. play that everyone's getting. But it would be nice, I know that there's discussions at the minute about trying to find out ways of, of driving Well, I look forward to sales. you guys supporting National Album Day in the UK in June. And, uh, lots of yeah, I mean, it's not, and there are lots across, of across the board, there's, yeah. there's, you know, people are linking, like Spotify funding Spotify. There's, so there's yeah. no reason we can't look into ways of, of kind of helping actual physical sales rise. Yeah, but again, I think consumers aren't stupid, and I go to Mark's point that you know, um, actually, I mean, you were saying it. You know, you're a, you know, you're an artist. You're going out there. You're selling lots of merch. You're selling lots of CDs. Mm. 
people aren't buying the CD because they can't hear it on Spotify, right? They're buying the CD because they want to support you. Yeah. yeah exactly. Right. I do so think people make the connection. They help. say, you know what? I want to support you. I like what you're doing. I love your music. I want to help you. The, the fans surely also looking for slightly closer engagement with the artist. I mean, it's one thing to listen to your Spotify. It's another thing to buy your CD, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. And go to your show. Exactly. And or, or talk with me by email or by Facebook or by fucking WhatsApp, by whatever. You know, but just talk. Just talk. I agree. Keep people together. Like so that's right. what music's supposed to be. So the future of music is really driven by the relationship between the artist and fans. You can't have all your yeah, fans WhatsApping you all the time, though, can you? It's not even fans. It's well, at some point it's ways of managing it. It's fans. <laughs> Yeah, listen, definitely, but I would just, I'd maybe um, say something a little bit contentious and maybe get Mark to, to comment on it. That I, I believe in the old world, in the physical world, uh, nobody actually bought music, okay? They bought pieces of plastic. And they bought a piece of plastic with a license to enjoy the music on it, mm -hmm. okay? And this goes back to the foundation of the major labels, the big record companies were formed, you know, after the war. They were... Um, petrochemical companies they had massive stocks of vinyl that were very cheap and basically it's like you know canneries for tuna you know you, you catch the tuna if you process it into cans suddenly you add a lot of value to it if you have a kilo of, of vinyl it's worth like one euro and then you put some music on it and 180 worth 180 grams of vinyl is suddenly worth 16 or 25 or 50 euro right so it's that same mentality that actually the, what the digital market has done is, is finally create an environment in which we're asking to pay for music for the first time. And that's really deeply challenging because music has never established an intrinsic value. Okay, the value is in the medium. So a tape, cassette, a CD, a vinyl, whatever it was, the value, the price was on the medium, not on the art. So me whistling into my iPhone and putting it on a CD was priced at the same as the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra recording at Abbey Road in London, you know, costing hundreds of thousands of pounds or whatever. Um, you know, the music was never priced. And the challenge in the digital age and, and the things that you're talking about, I think are the fantastic opportunities, finally, finally, to start to challenge the, 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 the wider world to say music has value, right? I hope. I think that there's a, there's a company called Sound Diplomacy working in That's Cardiff. That's where he works. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that. It's funny, that. That's why I know. Do you know, do you know any companies that might be uh, able to work yeah, in that space? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll think about it. <laughs> so you're, you're looking at, like, sort of bringing a bigger value to music, to governments, and explaining all the roles that it does outside of just creating a sale. And I think that your role is, is really important in, in driving artist revenues and staining labels. I think, I, think, I think it's early days, right? I think, I, think, um, I, live, I live in Spain. You live in Spain? Yeah, I live in Spain. You live in Spain, yeah. I think we all know that when public money comes into music, there's a temptation for politicians to uh, only sponsor what is in tune with, their, with what they want to put across to the public. I mean, that's been the model in Spain for so long. In the 1980s, almost all touring was paid for by ayuntamientos, and so if you were on the socialist side, you'd be, get, you'd, be, you'd be playing these cities, and if you're on the Pepe side, you'd be playing in other cities, and <coughs> we see that, you know, we see that, uh, I, I, you know, I, I know you live in Barcelona, but I do find that the artists I have from Catalonia who sing in Spanish, don't get quite the same amount of help from the public bodies as the ones who sing Catalan. So, you know, I think there's a, da there's, a da there's a danger in depending on public money for art. But the Arts Council, you know, there's some data out this week from UK Music that show that the Arts Council, you know, 63% of its funding goes to, like, opera, 3% goes to contemporary music. 3%, right? So, even with, you know, legislation changing for, like, the agent of change in London that's going to help protect small venues, yeah. uh, and all these things going on, we have a fundamental problem in music, certainly in the UK, and I, I assume it's replicated across Europe and elsewhere, that, you know, for example, sport receives heavy investment. Music doesn't. I would argue with anybody that sport has a more binary outcome for participants than music. Okay, mm. sport, you win or lose. Sport, you make the grade or you don't. You're professional or you're not, right? Music is 
a journey that can enrich your life forever, whether or not you become a professional musician. Okay, and if you don't become a professional musician, you can still play on the weekend with your friends. You can go to jam sessions, you can do all kinds of things. And I know you can go and play Sunday League football, right? But my point is that along the way, people have this, I think, slightly bizarre idea that let's say you're studying science, okay? And people say, oh great, if you study science, you could be an engineer or you could get a job in a big corporation. Yeah, you can, in a, uh, a chemical company or a, a car company, all these big companies, they need engineers, right? And I think this is, this is absolutely fucking mental. Because if you read any of the research that these governments are putting out, they're saying, how do we future-proof the labor market in the face of increased use of robots, artificial intelligence, and you know, the implementation of machines? It's through creativity, it's through entrepreneurship, okay? Music and the creative industries, whether or not you end up there, open the door to entrepreneurial opportunity in a way that the study of sciences never does. And I feel it's, it, it's, an in, it's a, I can see you revving for a response, which is great, but I think it's a massively missed opportunity. And it's very naive for governments not to support uh, uh, people's exploration of career pathways into the creative industries to the same degree they do the sciences. Because I think there are just, you know, and you look at the number of sort of musicians who are maybe still or not anymore musicians who have other incredible businesses because you know what, fundamentally if you're in music, your job is to create something out of nothing and get people to buy it. And you can apply that anywhere. So Alex James, he's a you know, musician from a very famous British band, he's got a salmon farm in Scotland or a cheese business. People, you know, people go from music and set up incredible businesses that do incredibly well. And I think that's because what they're learning through their journey in music, whether or not it's successful, is fundamentally the skill set that actually our economy across the world needs mm. to survive the next generation of robots. I think yeah. you can get that from physics as well, to be honest, but I wouldn't put music up against physics. I think. Why not? Put it up against maths, because, yeah, similar skill set. Sure. Languages, maths, similar. I think they're very similar in that sense. I think yeah. the future is probably creative. So why not fun? So why not fun? You know, that's why I think I we should that fund I wanted to be the phrase that finished the... Uh... Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> I agree. What yeah, I mean, no, again, I, I, I think, I think the, opp the opportunity... I think with all that you're talking about, with artificial intelligence, with yeah. 3D printing, with ro robots, I think the people who, the people are going to... Uh, move the world forward in the future are going to be creative. So don't say necessarily more from the arts or more from the sciences, but it's going to be people using their imagination to take us forward. I ultimately, you can get machines to do a lot of the st a lot of the boring stuff. And ultimately, Mark, I would say that was always the case. Whatever field you were in, uh, you know, um, Stephen Hawking, phenomenally creative man. Hmm. Yeah, whether you're whatever art sciences. Creativity shoves us forward, and therefore, you know, I remain, I come back to the fact I remain hugely optimistic about the future of music and its place in society. All yes, right. me too. We've got to wrap it up. Okay. Really Good. <laughs> Thank you.